next time we will get a funding from Toshiba so we can use some sort of Japanese technology. <laughs> uh, I'd like to uh, present you the last keynote speaker uh, of the conference, uh, Professor Barnard Stevens from uh, University of Catholic de Leuven, uh, Catholic University of Louvain uh, from Belgium. He's the Belgium's finest uh, Japanese philosophy. Uh, if you open page 10 of your program, you can actually see his uh, biography. Uh, it's very short, but you can see so many different places he's been to, uh, so many different boards uh, he's been working, uh, and also so many publications. So I'm not going into details of his biography, but I'd like you to uh, look at it. Uh, we can hear the microphone from outside. <laughs> Today, Professor Stevens is going to talk about Karen and Mariana, two complementary approaches to Karen. Uh, since we are quite behind the schedule, we would like to start the presentation. Uh, welcome. Another remark well, concerning the older generation and the younger generation. When I started getting interested in Kyoto School philosophy about 20 or 25 years ago, <coughs> it was uh, a terra incognita philosophy, uh, particularly in the French speaking world. There were very few uh, exceptions. Well, Professor Federic Guerra is, is one of the two exceptions, the other one being uh, um, the Polish center, otherwise it will really tell an increment of, of philosophy. And, which, and to start studying that subject will at the same time uncomfortable and comfortable, unpleasant and pleasant. Pleasant in the way that um, we felt rather free open the path and 
and to explore this terra incognita and to draw the map of it. Um, but at the same time, it, it was uncomfortable because um, uh, there, there's, there's no academic place for it. I mean, we do study philosophy, we do study Asian studies, but there is no thing in the academic world in, in, in Europe, no thing such as Japanese philosophy. So it's a bit like sitting between two chairs. It's a bit uncomfortable. <laughs> Um, and concerning, concerning the young generation, um, among which some people are present here, um, okay, maybe uh, you, 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 the path has been opened in a way, uh, so you, maybe you're not um, the pioneers anymore, but it doesn't make it more comfortable. Uh, the academic world hasn't changed, and there's still no place for Japanese philosophy. So it remains very difficult, and I think it's very courageous to, to do such a study. Plus the fact that you have to take into account what has been done before. And I think the, the, the demands and the knowledge of the language and the culture are higher. So I think it's not an easy task to study Japanese philosophy nowadays. I, I admire the young generation and I'd like to encourage you. Um, and I'm very impressed by this first meeting, which is done by the young Japanese. So uh, I will be reading my text. Um, and about this text, I have another reason to be a bit embarrassed. Uh, is that, well, the text is of course uh, is in here. Um, <laughs> when I was asked to send my title and text, I did. I wrote something about it quickly, and then uh, I sent it. But it's full of mistakes. Um, so what I'm going to read today is not exactly the same. Some of the mistakes have been um, not just English mistakes, but con content mistakes. Some have been corrected, and then there are remarks have been added, um, and there are, uh, there are conclusive remarks, which uh, are not in, at all in the text, and which I would like to, 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 to say as well. <coughs> well, to start with, um, the title already. <laughs> uh, Two contemporary approaches to utilitarianism. Um, Aaron and Maruyama, of course, are not contemporary to us. They're contemporary to each other. And what they have analyzed is the utilitarian system almost a century ago, in the 1930s and 1940s. Um, so it doesn't correspond exactly to the totalitarian phenomena that are reappearing today. But um, their analysis, their way of looking at things, may perhaps help us understand what is happening today. And that's the reason why I'm talking about, about it. So now to my, my text. Oh, yes, and then our remark, you can stop me anytime. Uh, after a while, I'll be repeating. Not that I'll be repeating myself all the time, but the main idea will be thrown quite early, and then I'll just turn in going to decisions later on. And uh, I'm not, if I'm not conscious of the time, I'm just going to stop and then I'm done with the conclusions. So I would like to put forward here some of the ideas proposed by Hannah Arendt and Maria Marasau on fascism and totalitarianism. I will be calling, uh, talking as a so-called specialist of Japanese thought, which and not in a way, nor even as a professional philosopher, but as an ordinary intellectual of today. In this early phase of the 21st century, when many signs seem to show that we are entering the new, what Hannah Arendt had called dark times. 
time during which new forms of fascism have appeared, including here in Europe, and during which totalitarian methods <coughs> and solutions could fall upon us in some unexpected manner. As intellectuals, we must be aware of that, and we must try and safeguard the spirit of civilization against it. We must safeguard humanism against the destruction of the human on which is based any totalitarian system. I see Arendt and Maruyama here as guides for us in that perspective. So the Arendtian analysis of totalitarianism are well known today. One aspect of their relevance lies in the way Hannah Arendt managed to bring together under one single typology two political regimes that seem ideologi ideologically anti-fetic, anti Hitlerism and Stalinism. So I would like to join here to Arendt's typology a few remarks made by Maruyama Masao concerning the Japanese variation of the, tot the totalitarian phenomenon the ultra-nationalistic or militaristic regime of the 1930s, 1940s. No author today can seriously deny the fascist character of this regime. Uh, the fact that Imperial Japan of the 1930s and 40s is indeed a form of fascism is obvious, particularly if we have in mind the ideology it openly claimed. Maruyama writes, that all fascist movements have in common, I quote, the rejection of the worldview of individualistic liberalism, the opposition to parliamentary politics, which is the political expression of liberalism, the insistence on foreign expansion, a tendency to glorify military buildup and war, a strong emphasis on racial myth and the national essence, a rejection of class warfare and a struggle against Marxism. The fascist movements reject both capitalism and socialism because both appear to be a form of materialism that refuses any spiritual elevation. However, we know that in practice, all the fascist states will eventually ally themselves with the capitalistic plutocracy and also in the case of Hitler, support Bolshevism in order to combat the common democratic enemy. Now, Japanese fascism, as described by Maruyama, possesses a few distinctive peculiarities. <clears throat> the insistence on family structure, which is extended to the nation as a whole, seen as one big family united around the imperial family. This insistence, in addition to the fact that it confirms the fusion of the private and the public, reinforces many things. It reinforces the conviction to belong to the same blood. It reinforces the easy analogy between filial piety and social loyalty to the superior. The joining of the rural populations, still numerous, where the family cell was essential. Now, the rural population, already here pairs of a long tradition of peasant uprising, were worried about industrialization and about industrial and urban development that didn't favor them. And the fascist movement in Japan very cleverly managed to seduce the provinces with agrarian traditionalistic ideas. For example, the glorification of the family precisely, and the number of promises, all broken, such as decentralization and a greater autonomy for the rural communities. So agrarianism is probably the main difference between Japanese ultranationalism and national socialism in Germany, which was, which was more preoccupied with recovering the working class. Another peculiarity of Japanese fascism compared to Hitlerism, and which brings us close at this time to Stalinism, is the declared ambition to liberate Asia from Western imperialism. Such a liberation was meant to happen through the creation of the sphere of the prosperity of greater Asia. 
guy to write your patent. But as everyone knows today, the latter became simply a pretext for Japanese imperialism all the time. Now, the fact that this Japanese variation of fascism had reached a proper totalitarian dimension is precisely what emerges from a comparison of Arendt and Maruyama's analysis. Um, it is not always easy to make the distinction between fascism and totalitarianism. Let us say, in general terms, that fascism remains within the constitutional system established by the rule of law, except that the whole party system has been confiscated by one single party, which progressively imposes an authoritarian regime and that and the suppression of all political opposition. The, totalitar <clears throat> the totalitarian system, in addition to all that, is a movement that needs to keep radicalizing itself. It's a movement that needs to move, radicalizing itself. And where governance is executed through the secret police rather than through the obvious official means, such a movement aims at the progressive destruction of the legal order of the rule of law and is animated by the will to global domination, both outside the country, the walls of expansion, and inside the country, the reign of terror, robotization, and dehumanization of the population. The creation of the concentration system, where this latter goal is experimentally put into practice before being widened to the whole population is the clearest symptom that the regime has turned completely totalitarian. Now, the interest of joining the attribute totalitarian to the description of Japanese fashion doesn't lie in the formulation of a new grievance against a regime that has been anyway universally condemned for decades by everybody, as much in Japan as abroad. But rather, in giving a new proof of the eminently modern character of the Japan of the 20th century, taking into account here the fact that totalitarianism, as Hannah Arendt has shown, is a product of modernity. Let everyone understand that the term modernity may be more come back on that later on. And to some extent, a reaction against modernity, which confirms its dependence on it. Now, it seems to me that Japanese modernity, which some people still contest, forces us to take into account the Japanese cultural phenomenon within all discussion concerning modernity and its critique, considering also the fact that if Japan is modern to the same extent as the West during the 20th century, it is so according to its own proper cultural heritage, the acknowledgement of which should be able to enrich the present day discussions on modernity in Europe, and it would enable us to overcome the extremely iterative character of the arguments that we keep hearing in them. So what Hannah Arendt has proposed in The Origins of Totalitarianism is, starting from a combined examination of Bolshevism and Nazi, a real typology of totalitarianism. It may seem regrettable at first sight that her analysis isn't equally nourished by Japanese ultranationalism, but actually this defect transforms itself into an advantage when one realizes that it enables us to better underline the remarkable relevance of our ancient typology. Once we discover that, although elaborated with an eye on Stalinism and Hitlerism, it also applies to the militaristic xenocentric system. But of course, it is in particular between German national socialism and Japanese ultranationalism that the comparisons are the most obvious, and we will concentrate on these as does Naoyama Masao himself. It, so, um, about Arendt's um, analysis in the origin of totalitarianism, which is three volumes, one of anti Semitism. Second on imperialism and the third 
on the top of the system. Uh, the first volume is, just, is the less uh, relevant to the Japanese case, of course, since there was no particular anti semitism in Japan, as far as I know. But it's in the second volume that the typological uh, analogies become really striking. It is known that the Japanese nation after Meiji has constructed itself following a heterogeneous Western model. To economic nationalism <coughs> and enlightened despotism in the manner of this market Prussia is a joint imperialistic colonization in the, matter, in the manner of the Atlantic capitalistic powers, mainly Britain and France. Less preoccupied than the latter about the democratic pretext and about the legislative framework of democracy, Imperial Japan of the first half of the Showa period, whose militaristic expansion follows so the colonial logic of advanced industrialized nations, such as France, Britain, but also Holland and Berlin, as we must admit, will have little scruple when it will need to use the same principles which is unlimited economic growth becoming altogether the final end and the initial engine of expansion. Colonial administration creates a bureaucracy whose principle of governing, governing is not lawfulness but decree or statutory order and whose means of action include state violence. Social cohesion in the home country is cemented by deviating class consciousness and conflict at the level of the nation towards ethnic consciousness at the level of the empire. The tribal unity of the members of the dominating nation, presented as more civilized or even ethnically superior, in front of the dominating nations, which are seen as backwards or inferior. These phenomena that Hannah Arendt analyzes in the case of the European imperialistic powers at the end of the 19th century are all to be found in Japanese imperialism at the beginning of the 20th century. It's, it's very, the parallelism is very strong. In both cases, they contribute, and in a comparable way, to the preparation of the First World War, which is clearly a war between rival imperialistic powers. And in both cases, they contribute in preparing fascist ideology and its totalitarian organization. The hypocrisy of capitalistic democracies, which are at the same time inegalitarian and imperialistic exploiters, fuels <coughs> the despise of human rights and the loss of credit of the democratic ideal. Colonial administration creates a bureaucracy whose very methods contradict the legal principles of the rule of law and prefigure the totalitarian conduct. And finally, in Europe, as in Japan, the ascent of the Soviet power during the 1920s is felt more and more like a growing threat in front of which fascism would be perceived by many as the strongest possible effects. So the totalitarian system is established differently in Russia, in Germany, and in Japan since there is respectively a violent revolution, the October Revolution of 1917 in Russia, three elections, uh, the election of Hitler in 1933 in, in Germany, and the progressive militarization of the regime in Japan. So, a word about this militarization, because the difference also in the rise of fascism in Japan, to Germany, and compared to Soviet Stalinism is the extremely progressive manner it has established itself. So, so the, the exact moment when it becomes a fascist and when it becomes a totalitarian is not very clear. It's a progressive process. Maruyama distinguishes three phases in the development of the Japanese fascist movement. One, the preparatory period, which extended from about 1919, just after World War I until the Manchurian incident of 1931, when, after a number of failed military coups, notably against Prime Minister, Prime Minister Hamaguchi, 
the army decided to invade Manchuria and establish a puppet state, Manchu War. The civil government, forced to retrospectively recognize what had happened, had obviously already lost its authority in favor of the military. Yet a number of civilian right-wing movements were being created, paying thus the way to the civil acceptance of the military regime. The second stage, Mariana distinguishes, is called the period of maturity. Uh, is a period during which the military became openly the driving force of the fascist movement, rallying most of the civilian right-wing organizations. This period is also marked out by a series of failed military coups, establishing a permanent state of terror, thus a terrorism, against the Japanese population, until the February 26th incident in 1936, which shook the entire nation. And then the third stage, what he called the Constitutionation period, that grew from the army purge after the February 26th, where the actors of the coup were only mildly condemned by the civil power, in order to go to prison, could be got out anyway. Uh, they were only mildly condemned by the civil power, and this period goes until the Pacific War, with the Tojo dictatorship, and ending in the disastrous way that we all know on the 15th August 1945. During this period, said Maruyama, I quote, the military, now the open supporter of fascism from above, fashioned an unstable ruling structure in coalition with the semi feudal power of the bureaucracy and the senior retainers on the one hand, and with monopoly capital from the political parties on the other. So those are the three um, periods that Maruyama distinguishes in the rise of Japanese fascism. So clearly the totalitarian system establishes itself differently in the standard given. But once established, it functions its functioning, sorry, and its continuous intensification follows the same logic. Massification and atomization of social classes, suppression of rights and liberties, establishment of a police state, and reign of terror in, in view of the to total robotization and domination of the population. It happens in the three countries. There is, in each case, the creation of an ideological fiction in order to compensate the vacuum of meaning created by the social atomization and by the destruction of the old order. <coughs> there is the substitution of a monolithic of a monolithic mass movement in place of the, the diversified party system. There is a breaking of the international consensus juris, a militarization of the regime, the establishment of a foreign policy aiming more and more openly at world domination, the creation of a concentration system with its reign of terror, and finally, the relentless, the relentless pursuit of the whole system in a more and more suicidal manner when the final collapse is more and more in June. During all this, the role of the ideological fiction is determining because it is such a fiction that will canalize and sublimate, sublimate? sublimate. the frustration of the masses which are endemic in the capitalistic society. And also it will bring about the rallying of the intellectuals in the surprising phenomena of what Aaron called the temporary alliance between the mob and the elite. Indeed, the frustration of the masses comes from the loss of meaning whose origins are complex, but which are linked in any case 
to the social upheaval occasioned by the hasty entrance into industrial capitalism, what Heidegger called in, a simple term, in simple terms, the age of technology. There is, among other things, the uprooting of populations of a, of a rural origin who have been too rapidly taken away from the craft type mode of production for the so-called cottage industry, with its communities structured in classes or corporations or guilds, and too rapidly thrown into the production line of the industrial exploitation system, losing the possibility of rallying into parties of common interest, creating thus social atomization. Social atomization, that is, the loss of a social anchoring and the push pushing back of each person towards the isolation of its own individuality. Or at the best, its family itself. The complementary phenomena of massification and atomization signify the disappearance of the nexus of human relations that constitute a public space and it is accompanied by the perishing of traditional popular culture, when at the same time the avant-garde urban culture alienates more and more the bourgeois public, which tends towards a nostalgic cultural consumption of more and more outmoded form. Popular circles and bourgeois circles both suffer from a lack of meaning, even an existential vacuum. In short, they are filled by an expectation a strong expectation, unclear but strong, notably of change, an expectation that will make them ever more vulnerable to the ideological fiction of the totalitarian discourse. So if we now look at the ideological fiction, of each great totalitarian movement that we have talked about. We must recognize differences. In the case of Stalinism, it's a schematization of Marxian philosophy of history with a local adaptation to pan Slavonic machinism. In the case of Nazi Germany, there is a Nietzschean type of vulgarization of Darwinian, Darwinian evolutionism. And finally, in the case of Japan, there is a simplification, politization, and militarization of the Shinto doctrine. But these divergences, these strong divergences in the content, do not prevent the ideological fictions to play fundamentally the same role. That is, intoxication of the masses and the legitimization of power with the use of so-called laws that are either historical in the case of Russia, natural in the case of Germany, or divine in the case of Japan, and in any case, by essence, superior to the human laws and superior to the consensus jurist that rules the relations between nations as it rules within a rule of law the relation between individuals in the same state. The German situation during the Weimar Republic, 1918-1933, uh, is quite comparable to that of the time during the Taisho era, 1912-1926, where Marxists and conservative nationalists, both ideologically, ideologically and vitetic, worked objectively together in view of the disintegration of a rule of law that was already less asserted in the archipelago than it was in Germany. During the first part of the Shoah era, so 1926-1945, with the confirmed militarization of the regime, together with its continuous, <coughs> continuously more nationalistic and totalitarian turn, the leftist intellectuals were progressively silent by force while conservatives were themselves oscillating between keeping silent for the most moderate or supporting, supporting openly the regime for the most opportunistic. So there was little clear resistance in Japan, we must admit, except for the rare convinced Christians or Buddhists 
or if you Marxist who didn't change style. And thus the question remains as to know what was particular to the Japanese situation in order to encourage the support for such a significant number of the intellectuals, among which some eminent philosophers of the time. How much time was there? So this is where Maruyama Masao's contribution are particularly um, interesting. Where his contribution reveals itself to be most valuable in his endeavor to understand principally two things. How fascism could develop on the political foundations established by Meiji, and how the Japanese intellectuals formed during decades in Western thought could have fallen prey so easily to the irrationalistic mythology of the imperial way. We will base ourselves here on his studies, well, I already know them from now. Today, a classic put together under one volume under the title Gendai Seiji no Shiso or Kodo, translated slightly differently in English, Thought and Behavior in Modern Japanese Politics. So which, which has been my main source for this talk. Keeping his distance from the Marxism of a number of his colleagues during the 1950s and 1960s, during which he writes this book, Maruyama tries to explain not just the conscious ideology of Japanese ultra-nationalism, but also the often unconscious values and prejudices that underlie it. The question for him is to show that the fascist period was not just, as it is often presented, a simple deviation due to international circumstances in relation to the fundamental movement of democratization that allegedly characterized contemporary Japan's explanation, but that it was rather the expression of some element obscurely inherent within Japanese cultural sensibility and which, having never been seriously taken into account, or overcome, suddenly came into open and asserted themselves in an unbridled way. Consequently, while establishing some parallels with Marxism and underlying how the two movements participate to the same logic, which puts him in tune with Hannah Arendt, Maruyama endeavored to underline at the same time the specificity of Japanese fascism. Furthermore, while doing this, Having studied them closely, he is distrustful of Hegelian and Marxist philosophies of the necessary sense of history, and he intends to keep faith in a history understood as what he says, the progress towards consciousness and freedom, as it was expressed during the period of enlightenment and revisited by authors such as Max Weber, Karl Mannheim, Fukuzawa Yukichi, and Nakai Chomin. I, I say that because um, Mahoyama has often been accused of being a Marxist, which he clear, clearly is not. Um, he criticizes, well, of course, uh, militarism and derived militarism, and he criticizes what in capitalism has driven forward it. But as soon as someone criticizes capitalism, one is categorized as Marxist. Um, Hannah Arendt also criticizes capitalism in a very, very violent way, but she is far from being a Marxist. So, um, but, well, Maruyama is more a thinker of the Enlightenment, I would say, than in the end, so French. Um, Hannah Arendt as well, although, but in her own way, she's a Heideggerian, and uh, her inspiration is the Greek experience constantly goes back to the Greek idea of, of, of democracy, um, rather than in the United So she's not part of the practical school, for example. She was only criticized of So the first difficulty, in order to understand the specificity of Japanese nationalism in space, lies in its mixed nature. 
On the one hand, it belongs to the logic of modern European nationalism, following which it tried to construct itself. And on the other hand, it resembles Asian nationalism, to which it belongs historically. Asian nationalism, that is, nationalism of China, of India, and of the nation of Southeast Asia, of which the combination manifested itself in the immediate post-war period, post-Second War period, is a revolutionary and anti-colonial nationalism. It is a struggle to liberate Asia from Western imperialism and from the local ruling classes who were collaborating with the latter. Now, Japan, although it shared the Asian ideal of an anti-imperialistic struggle, distinguished itself from the other Asian nations, first by the fact that it hadn't been properly colonized by any Western power, but simply kept it lead economically and politically. Second, by the fact that its nationalistic struggle for independence had been led by the ruling elite rather than by the people or the bourgeoisie. And third, by the fact that it had tried to ensure its own autonomy by producing a sort of higher bidding of European nationalism. This led it precisely to colonial expansionism, and notably in the direction of Asia. Japanese nationalism had, in that sense, says Mariyama, lost its virginity. Wanting to measure itself to Westerners, it committed the same abuses as the Moreover, not stemming from a popular basis, but from the ruling class, it had rapidly reproduced all the failings of capitalist ex exploitation and then of the authoritarianism that is proper to extreme government control. But then compared to the West, again Japanese nationalism appears ambiguous. Indeed, the national consciousness of each of the various nation states in Europe has constructed itself against the background of a common belonging together, the same civilization, reaching back to the aim of universality of the Catholic Church and the Roman Empire, and constituted of the implicit consciousness of a proper League of Nations, what is today imagination. Correlative of a universality shared by all the nations that are part of the League. And by contrast, in Asia, each great nation, India, China, Japan, is at the same time a relatively autonomous civilization in spite of mutual influences, and thus forming a relatively closed world, ethnocentric, forced precisely to open itself to the international world because of the encounter often conflictual with the West. Japan had opened itself to modern national consciousness, not just in the hope of liberating itself from the Western ascendancy, as the other Asian nations, but also, which makes a difference, in the desire to get assimilated within the international society that Western nations were forming together. So Japan tried to become, in a way, a Western nation. What somebody else called the other day, uh, an honorary, honorary European country. So we can say what we should manage to become quite quickly. So we can say that if Japanese nationalism at first effectively shared with its Asian neighbors the will to expel the barbarians, so a sudden no joint war, a revert of the emperor and expel the barbarians in the hope of escaping being subjected by them, and if for that sort of purpose it had constructed its own power following the principle of Western science, Japanese soul, or proper nation, strong army, its nature had progressively complexified itself in order to be recognized on equal terms with Western nations, which meant to adopt not just the material and technical means of Western power, but some elements of the consensus rules that regulates the relations between nations, <coughs> at least in the first stage. Because when, at the beginning of the 20th century, 
Japan had reached the economic and industrial level of Western nations. The social tensions caused by its too rapid industrialization, rather than leading it in the European way towards the progressive emancipation <coughs> and sovereignty of the people, dragged it in a reactionary and nationalistic policy where the adopted methods were Western colonial imperialism, rather, to, together with its pre totalitarian techniques, rather than the democratization and emancipation of the people. <coughs> so the Western contradiction between the capitalist expansion abroad and the democratization of the power was resolved in Japan after a brief sketching out of liberal, political liberalism, the Taisho era, in favor of the first element. This movement led Japan on the slope that we all know, causing by the same token its isolation from the international society to which it had initially which wished to belong. And the symbolic withdrawal from the League of Nations is in 1933. The refusal of this um, internationality which it had first wished to join. The fashionization, you say that in the fashionization, fashionization of Japan implied just as in Germany a forced national cohesion that would curb the popular aspirations towards emancipation. Such a cohesion was obtained not just with the help of expansionistic enthusiasm, the colonization, annexation, and, and external war that made people forget about internal tension and the correlative oppression, but also through an education and a propaganda that elevated the attachment to the concrete manifestation of Japanese unity, the person of the emperor. Now, as Maruyama underlined it, such a tendency existed in fact since the Meiji Restoration and was simply radicalized during the fascist period, which means that one must realize the temptation of some historians to present Meiji unilaterally as the Japanese period of enlightenment founding moment of a movement of democratization, of which upper nationalism would simply be a transitory and fortuitous deviation. Um, actually, I have said the most important elements. Uh, the rest of the talk is more or less uh, not a pure simple repetition, but a clarification of some of those elements. I think I'm, I'm approaching towards the end of the hour, so I would like to uh, go to the conclusions. So a, f a few concluding remarks. shows how Japanese ultranationalism is also, to some extent, a consequence of the Western-oriented modernization of the planet since Meiji. The latter seemed thus to have taken more from the totalitarian potential of European modernity, so clearly described by Arendt, than from its properly humanistic and emancipatory potential. So we see ourselves invited here to reinterrogate this rather unpleasant aspect of European modernity, of which we would be wrong to see only its progressive dimension. Second remark. This paradoxical conclusion of Maruyama's work on Japanese fascism recalls the paradox 
of his previous significant work, the study on the Neo-Confucianism of the Tokugawa period. So, Nihon Seiji Shiso Shi Kenkyo, which has been translated into English, a study in the intellectual history of Tokugawa Japan, and partially translated into the French of the title. In this work, Maruyama showed the beginnings of a modern political consciousness of a true progressive and humanistic style, precisely that what Meiji had swiped away. This native modern political consciousness, that is independent of any European influence, seems to suggest the necessity to inquire about the unexploited dimensions of modernity, susceptible to enrich the often problematic debates that are still discussed today on the subject of modernity and its possible overcoming. Third remark. The aspect of humanism that Maruyama stresses in this book on the Fukugawa period is mainly the progressive distinction between the private and the public sphere, and also the disruption of the natural ethical continuation that creates the hierarchical society of Neo-Confucianism, of Shi Neo-Confucianism. But other things can be said as well. One other aspect of this Asian humanism, for example, can be seen, I think, in what Watsuji has analyzed in his Ethics, Mindigaku, who does study with the an analysis of the keyword Ningen, human being, an analysis of quite well known. Ningen is itself accounted by two kinds of things, one meaning the person and the other one meaning the relationships, or can be interpreted as meaning the relationships between persons. Again. So, human beings are fundamentally a commun communal or groupal reality, a mid sign a being with others. Which Heidegger had also seen more than the sort of um, authenticity of, the, of human being in his individual signs of torture. So he lost that mid sign in favor of solipsism. And thus the individual, so prone to be alone and isolated in the massification of society, is an abstraction taken from this more fundamental togetherness. Couldn't this throw some light on what Arendt refers to when she speaks of the common world of human actions as the basis for any free political life? Fourth remark. Having just quoted Watsuji, there is another aspect of the previous analysis on totalitarianism I wish to stress. They throw a new light on the so-called participation of the Kyoto School philosophers to the regime. We know that the Navy, far less radical than the Army, had, um, and in search of a more acceptable solution to the impending war against the USA, had contacted the Kyoto School philosophers in order to organize a discussion that might have a favorable influence on the fate of Japan. Professor Ohashi gave us a talk on that subject in Paris a month ago. Therefrom came the famous Overcoming Modernity Symposium in Daimon Chozoku and the Symposium on Japan in World Perspective of the Small World Magazine. I won't enter here into the argument as to know who and to what degree one was a resistant or a sympathizer. It is not at all the subject of my talk today. But I, what I would like to stress is that the Kyoto School philosophers were a serious threat for the regime, whatever they said, for the simple reason that they were free thinkers, they were thinking free, and moreover, that they were in their philosophy, often using Western modes of thinking and Buddhist modes of thinking which were totally unwelcomed by the regime. I would like here to quote Anna Arendt, quote, under totalitarian conditions, 
every thought that deviates from the officially prescribed and permanently changing line is already suspect, no matter in which field of human activity it occurs, simply because of their capacity to think human beings are suspect by definition. And ideology is thus created to destroy free thinking that defines humanity. And the totalitarian system of terror is meant to radicalize such a destruction, going so far as the total destruction of the individual, in his legal person, in his moral person, and finally in his physical person. <coughs> Thinking freely is thus the first action of resistance against the totalitarian movement. And this is what the Kyoto School philosophers did. So this is my position. Remark number five. Finally, I would like to suggest how this enlargement of the analysis of totalitarianism from Stalinism to Hitlerism and from Hitlerism to xenocentrism can help us grasp events we are witnessing today. For example, the rise of Islamic fundamentalism, and particularly in the case of the Islamic State in Syria. In Particularly that so the fundamental not of not the Islamic religion, but the fundamental of the Islamic state in particular. When looking at the ideological fiction in each of the previous cases, we have the role of history and then the role of nature and then the role of the God becoming just more and more religious, and in this sense, irrational, or risking irrationality. And in the case of the Islamic State, we have the Sharia, or Islamic law, the so-called religious law of Allah, that has to be imposed on all Muslims, and eventually on all people, even the unfaithful, on the global level. So all the elements of totalitarianism are here present. It is not a political party, but a movement whose dynamics is constant radicalization and whose means of influence are armed force and terror, aiming at world domination. It is not yet a mass movement, since the mass of Muslims it is trying to reach throughout the planet remains broadly unmoved. But it has created a system of estranging, isolated individuals from any normal environment in order to attract them within the inner structure of, an, of a more and more radical activity. Once there, the individual is transformed into a jihadist, a so-called jihadist, but we all know that it's not the true significance of the term. He is himself dehumanized and becomes capable of the dehumanized attitude of total war, crime, and terror, which we have witnessed recently in many cases, with no consideration whatever left for the humanity of the victims. It is thus humanity as such which is here in danger of total destruction, as much among the victims as among the executions. And finally, remark number six. Now, it is not just the potential fascism and totalitarianism of Islamic fundamentalism, I want to stress here. But also, the danger that a strong reaction against it within our own nation states can create, which are still run by rule of law until now. So this could lead to the progressive loss of the legal framework that protects our rights and liberties. Maruyama had stressed this danger in the USA during the witch hunt of the Makati period of the 1950s. More recently, people have been worried about the Patriot Act in the US after the 9-11 attacks. And Europe today is not under full cover from such dangers. <coughs> so, as intellectuals, we must be aware of that and remain watchful. We must scrutinize, try and understand, and prevent. And as Buddhism tells us, we must be mindful. <laughs>
Glass, uh, keynote speaker of this conference. Uh, I would like to open this uh, uh, time for the questions. Atomization that Anna <laughs> described in her book, and which is the fact that people are um, isolated from society, from common life, is something which is much stronger even today than it was in, in those days. Mm -hmm. I mean, many people are just living in front of their computer, uh, not communicating with anybody, and well, and that's in a way its result of well. Modern days, which have not modern technologies. Um, but the optimization of society is a strong um, term that I really say that. Well, it, 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 it makes people vulnerable to the, to the other population. And um, I think we, and then not on the side of structures, we can um, easily slip into. Um, undemocratic um, decisions. So for example, just after the Paris um, attacks or when it was called the Master, uh, there was there was um, there was uh how do you say when you are people from the opinion? Oh a survey. Uh what do you mean that's what I mean after asking people would you be ready? I think it's good to read, um, simply read Arendt and Mariana and their way of analyzing things, always clarifying, you know, like something about what you need to more complicated than I Well, with them, uh, things which are at first unintelligible, and like how does a society become fascist or totalitarian? How do you enter in 
to a totalitarian system, a concentration system. When you read the writing, it becomes at least intelligible. So that way of analyzing things, maybe we should simply practice it and then turn our eyes towards our own society and maybe we will be able to understand better by ourselves. Consider the, I quote from the, um, uh, <laughs> okay, uh, we consider the, um, uh, the norm, the normative aspects, and the political activity on one hand, and life on the other. So she does a, a, a clear cut distinction between what happened in Polis, uh, Greek Polis, uh, and there, there was Oikos and there was, uh, and there was Polis. And Oikos and Polis were completely different, one private and the other public, etc. So the problem is, according to some critics of uh, her work, that uh, Anna Harit had no uh, tools to understand totalitarianism, exactly because totalitarianism pointed to the point of junction between oikos and polis, so by politics. So uh, I was, uh, and I was uh, thinking of this uh, position, especially when you were talking about the uh, idea that uh, in Japan, but I, mean, I, I think that also in Germany and other uh, uh, fascism could impose itself also through an ed education and propaganda, so through practices. Uh, so I will ask you what you think about it. Well, the, the distinction between Oikos and Oikos between the inside the house and outside and the public space. Um, what well, is the distinction that modern philosophers will try to reestablish the distinction of the private and, and the public, which completely disappears in the financial territory space. There is no, there is no private. Um, the public interferes in, in all of private life. You have no right to, uh, to privacy. Um, one of the important <coughs> things, for example, of the distinction between, or uh, uh, in, in what sense do they say that an Arab didn't understand the notation of the distinction? That's a very strong point. I mean, her whole book is yeah. made to explain what it is. Uh, Roberto Esposito was, uh, was uh, addressing this point, mm -hmm. saying that uh, <coughs> Nazism uh, could grow, especially because uh, uh, there was a kind of conflation between, um, between the norm and, uh, and, and life. And so the question of life 
life in what sense? Uh, life in the sense of oikos, in the sense of private, in the sense of what makes the people, uh, a person, a fair life. It's not simple. Thing. Well, also, Giorgio Gambit has done something about that. Uh, neither the absoluteness, I, I quote Esposito, neither the absoluteness of the norm, nor the primacy of nature, is to be considered external to a phenomenon like, like Nazism, which seems to be situated exactly at the point of intersection and, and tension of their opposing radicalizations. And so, uh, Esposito, for example, tries to avoid, to move away from Nazis' normativization of life toward a vitalization of the norm, just in the opposite direction. In this sense, uh, it would be quite interesting. Uh, so the vitalization of the norm, that's what you suggest? suggest to what the what, what, uh, yeah, it's positive said, yeah. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's pretty convergent with what Karen said. When she, she says that Mariama insists even more on his analysis of Japan that there was no private sphere at all that end up the norm. The values were dictated by the, by the, by the imperial um, ideology. So there's no, there's no room for, for private sphere. And when, when the public has managed <coughs> to uh, invade all your private life, in principle, what you can still do is think freely. And that's where the strength of the ideological fiction comes in, that when people can't even think anymore, uh, then the totalitarian system is a success. Yeah?
Well, so I'll stop. <laughs> <laughs> but about freedom, um, I mean, the redefinition of freedom, when you think that at the entrance of one of the Auschwitz conferences <coughs> written out by Marx V, uh, it really is quite a redefinition of freedom because it really makes people very free. But I think that's also the strength of geology when it makes people lose all contact with reality and that they believe in geology and they want to help it. I mean, that's, that's, that's the strength of, of geology when people uh, willfully participate and, and don't, feel, don't even realize they're present in that. Um, but right now the censorship um, You mean uh, we have to, to find a way of um, of expressing our ideas without it being without it being spotted? Is that what you mean? Mm -hmm. No, what I what I was the, the problem that I feel that we have when we read texts that were published, uh, written and produced in societies where censorship was the rule, um, is that we lack the experience of um, of expressing and reading under censorship to properly interpret these mm. texts. So okay. I think that was something you all were also pointing to. Mm. Yeah. I don't know. Well, yeah. For example, when we read um, Nishida, for example, is it maybe that's what you mean? Um, I suppose he didn't really believe what he was writing when he, he wrote his non no uh, what was it, non no Bokandai? Uh, Nihon Bokandai. Nihon Bokandai. Um, that's, that's, that's a different case. I think Jiro Koro introduction is a good example. When the war, war broke up, they had three discussions, and by the time the book was ready to be published, and the war broke out. And by that time, uh, the editor had to take the militaristic job for it to be published. And so today it's very difficult to negotiate how much was said by who and how much was it said. But that, I think it's a very good point. <coughs> so how to exercise a hermeneutical intelligence, 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 how to read between lines, become a kind of a necessity when we are dealing with. I, I, I mean, in every such society, there are codes. You know, the, the, the competent readers in such a society know how to read these texts, <coughs> uh, and we have to avail ourselves of the codes. So, but that's. I think it's a research project. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, I can certainly second that because uh, probably one of the few people in this room who has the experience. So, uh, <laughs> precisely such a society and I uh, can tell you that uh, it, it is really so that uh, there are some, for example, compulsory elements of the text which are like performances which you have to do in order just to get through and people just like uh, competent readers just, like glide over these. Uh, uh, they like, uh, for example, there was, uh, it was not possible to defend a doctoral dissertation that did not quote uh, Marx, Lenin, um, sometimes Stalin, and so on. So they just like you know, like skip through these pages and just start where uh, the, the thing is. You know? So poetry collections uh, were impossible to publish uh, during some times, which did not have uh, some really bad poems uh, glorifying the regime. Nobody read those poems. Uh, they were just. Uh, I think the, the the Russians called them uh, steam engines. You have to put a steam engine into a poetry collection that would drag it through, you know. They, uh, uh, so, so, uh, 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 Sorry? In Hungary, they call this red tails in the text, mm. no, 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 which you have no. to put at the end mm. to make it complete. Uh, so, uh, so uh, uh, Raj is completely right. Uh, uh, when we look at the texts of uh, uh, wartime Japanese intellectuals, we should not take them as, at face value, and it would be humanly incorrect to quote uh, uh, some things that are probably there just in order to have this thing, you know, vetted as a, as a genuine, uh, genuine article. Uh, but I had another comment as well, if uh, uh, we still have time. Uh, and uh, uh, I think.
think it is, it is a really, really uh, great of you to now look for resources uh, in the intellectual history uh, uh, of uh, the West and, and Japan uh, to find uh, resources uh, with which to try to comprehend uh, the totalitarianisms uh, that are rising today. And uh, uh, one thing when I was listening to uh, you talk about Arendt, uh, it started really worried, uh, started to really worry me is that um, uh, Arendt's uh, kind of optimism in, in the power of the people, uh, of uh, thinking that uh, 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 that, that power is the opposite of violence, that when people collectively stand up, then uh, the genuine power emerges and so on. So what would be better than social networks, yes? And uh, uh, we know uh, from all these Arab Springs and Orange Revolutions and so on, uh, that social networks have genuinely also contributed to uh, such kind of a power of the people. But when we look at what is happening on Facebook now, uh, with the Syrian and uh, the, the refugee crisis and so on, uh, you see that the power of the people can also be very dark, uh, that uh, 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 this fascism uh, does not necessarily come from uh, the reactions of the government, uh, but that the, the, the masses of the people, uh, because of fear, because of uh, uh, distrust, because of uh, anything, they just like, uh, uh, they get carried away by xenophobia, there is always some immoral leader who tries to get political capital on that and so on. And what is happening with, uh, with governments uh, uh, who are like uh, uh, reducing freedoms and so on is not necessarily the uh, uh, sort of vicious uh, will of the politicians to, uh, to take away our freedoms, uh, but they are like moving after the, uh, uh, the, the drive, the sort of totalitarian drive of the mob which comes out and, uh, 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 and, and does it. And, uh, and it is really difficult to, to fight that with, uh, with the resources that we have. Uh, I totally agree. There's a, there's a phenomenon that Nagoyama speaks of the power that, um, or the, the power that comes from, from, from the bottom of the society, uh, or, for, for, or the bottom of the hierarchy. For example, in the case of the military in Japan, it's the bottom of the hierarchy who made the, who made the military operations in China, and then afterwards the top had to recognize it. But um, what you're saying is about the general population, which can become very uh, xenophobic. And I think it's true. Uh, uh, and that's what I mean when I speak of the vulnerability of people. I mean, and any, any fascist. Um, this cause can easily, easily yeah. uh, seduce the people nowadays. And I think what we lack in all our societies, and it's for the it's for the arena of our, our, our capital and our kind of or the, the labor dimension, um, it, there's a lack of um, education towards the the, the values of, of of democracy. Of for example, I, it, there's been a lot of discussion recently well, in, 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 in Berlin after, after, after the Paris attacks because people who did the attack were living in Brussels actually. And then people also started thinking that how is it possible that Berlin, or um, it's not uh, Muslims, become the jihadists during the terrorist attacks. And then one of the answers says, but because they haven't been educated into the values of democracy. Maybe it's true, but I mean, the, the Belgian born Belgians of since a generation haven't been educated either. I mean, they're not anymore educated to, nobody is. Um, they're simply, it's, it's simply not part of our education, and that's, that's the problem, I think. Um, people, people have just become consumers. So, there's a question of education, and then maybe our own. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Stevens. Um, that was a really, really good really discussion. And uh, I actually made a mistake in the schedule, so we are actually ending on time. Maybe we can put things on and back in the course. So, thank you very much.
we are actually, uh, one announcement, we are actually taking the, uh, the, the picture of the group. <laughs>